Welcome all to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Wherever you are, in the car, on a walk with the dog, on the treadmill, trying to fall asleep, I appreciate you choosing my show to help you pass the time. I'm excited to have Rod Sadler on the show for the very first time. He worked as a police officer in mid-Michigan for 30 years and has written a number of true crime books, including A Slayer Waits, The True Story of a Michigan Double Murder, and To Hell I Must Go, The True Story of Michigan's Own Lizzie Borden. His most recent book, out this past August, is called Grim Paradise, The Cold Case Search for the Mackinac Island Killer. Thank you for coming on. Great to have you. Oh, thank you so much, Eric. I'm always excited to do these podcast interviews, uh, and I thank you for having me on your on your uh, podcast. Of course, yeah. So before we get to the events in your book, could you tell us a bit about your years as a police officer and how you got into writing true crime? Oh, sure. I worked for 30 years in law enforcement here in mid-Michigan, uh, the last 25 of those years as a, uh, a deputy and then a sergeant uh, with the rural sheriff's department. And uh, we received our, uh, our police authority from the county sheriff's office. The, it's called the Ingham County Sheriff's Office. And uh, my dad had always told me that my great-great-grandfather had been the sheriff, the elected sheriff here in Ingham County in 1897. And so I began to do a little family history uh, while I was a police officer uh, because I thought that was kind of cool, me being a a deputy sheriff and my great-great-grandfather having been the sheriff. And uh, I came across a newspaper article from the time when he served as the sheriff, and it detailed a really gruesome murder in the town literally where I grew up, uh, a small town uh, east of our state capital, Lansing. And uh, I thought, wow, this would really make a really interesting book. And so I put that off really until until I retired in 2012, and then I started uh, writing that first book. And I really enjoyed it so much. I got such good uh, feedback on it, especially locally, uh, that I continued to write. And, and actually, uh, I'll just make a quick correction as you, as you went through my books there at the beginning. There's a third book in between uh, Slayer Waits and Grim Paradise, and that book is called Killing Women. And that details East Lansing serial killer Don Miller, who murdered four women in the late uh, 70s uh, right here in Ingham County at the uh, Michigan State University campus. So that's kind of a, in a, a real quick nutshell how I got into writing. And, and uh, I'm working on my fifth book already. I enjoy it so much. That, that's great. Yeah. So when did you first hear about the Francis Lacey case? Well, about three or four years ago, uh, my wife and I and some friends went up to Mackinac Island. And in Mackinac Island, um, just so you know, Mackinac Island is Michigan's crown jewel. And it is uh, a vacation destination worldwide, vacation destination. Uh, People travel here from all over the world. And... uh, It's unique in the fact that they allow no automobiles on the island. Transportation is limited to uh, horse and carriage, foot travel, or by bicycle. Uh, And it's been that way since 1898. Uh, They do have some emergency vehicles on the island, some fire trucks, uh, an ambulance, a police vehicle. But other than that, all you'll see on Mackinac Island is tourists and uh the locals traveling around uh, by horse and carriage or walking or riding a bike. And so uh, through my, throughout my life, I've been up there just a couple times and, and three or four years ago, my wife and some friends went up there uh, for a paranormal investigation, strange escapes with Amy Bruni and Adam Berry from ghost hunters and kindred spirits. And we were at mission point resort, which is on the East end of the Island. And we decided to do the Haunts of Mackinac 
walking tour that night. And they mentioned this murder that had occurred in 1960 and uh, how the killer had escaped and how it was still unsolved. And I kind of filed that away. And then this past summer, I take that back, uh, two years ago, this past summer, I was chatting with my boss who uh, participates in the uh, world-renowned uh, Port Huron to Mackinac race, which coincides opposite the um, Chicago to Mackinac yacht race uh, here in Michigan. Those are two uh, big sporting events a week apart. And I mentioned the murder on the island, and he said, boy, you ought to write a book about that. And so uh, I started my research, and it just uh, progressed from there. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but to answer your question, I heard about it for the first time just two or three years ago. So w- would you tell us about Frances Lacey, why she went to Mackinac Island? Who did she go with? Sure. Frances Lacey was uh, a widow. Uh, she had lost her husband about three years prior to this trip to Mackinac Island. So in 1957, uh, she lost her husband. Uh, She had a son and a daughter, and she really, uh, she was a very caring and a very loving person. She seemed to be liked by everyone, although it was hard for people to get to know her. But once they did, they realized uh, what a wonderful woman that she was. And she hadn't really done anything uh, since her husband's death. And finally, her daughter and son-in-law convinced her to go to Mackinac Island for the weekend. It was the weekend of the Chicago to Mackinac yacht race. And so they drove up on a Friday night. They got there early on a Saturday morning. And her son-in-law's mother had rented a cabin in an area on the island called British Landing. And they wanted Francis to stay there uh, with the family. And Francis didn't want to put anyone out. And so she decided to stay at a hotel instead. And so she stayed at the Murray Hotel uh, on the island. And she got a room on the second floor. And she told her daughter on Saturday evening, she said, I will just walk out to British Landing tomorrow morning. And her daughter was a little concerned. Her daughter said, you know, that's about a three-mile walk. It'll probably be an hour and a half for you to walk out there. And so Frances told her daughter, she said, if I get tired, I'll just hail a horse and carriage, and uh, I'll take a taxi the rest of the way. And so by 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, Frances Lacey hadn't showed up at British Landing, and her daughter and son-in-law became quite concerned. And they eventually notified the uh, Michigan State Police. Michigan State Police, although the the post for that particular district was in St. Ignace on the uh, mainland in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, they also had uh, three troopers that were assigned to the island. And so uh, they called the Michigan State Police. They took a uh, missing persons report and the search for Francis began at that point on uh, Sunday morning, July 24th, 1960. The police department on the island definitely needed help. The police chief, uh, Bloomfield, was pretty new to the job, right? He was. Uh, chief Bloomfield was uh, just two weeks into the job as chief. And really, the Mackinac Island uh, Police Department They had jurisdiction over this one mile square, basically, for the village of Mackinac Island. That that's what the name of the village is, even though it is located on Mackinac Island. So you had the the Michigan State Police, who had one trooper on duty, and you had the Mackinac Island Police Department, a department of only three officers. And so the the Michigan State Police took the original missing person report. And then they were assisted by the uh, the Mackinac Island Police in some of the investigation also. Not a whole lot, but uh, to some degree they were. So there are only a, a finite number of places to go on an island, right? Uh, in a typical missing persons case, you know, someone could get into a car, be taken, 
and be a hundred miles away in, in just hours. It should be easier to find her here. And this is in the midst of a, a busy tourist season as well. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, Mackinac Island is literally uh, eight square miles and the island itself. And the, the village of Mackinac Island is like one square mile. And, and that is, is a lot of tourist shops, um, hotels, things like that, all crammed into this, this little island. And then the rest of the island really is, is covered with horse trails and walking trails and geometric uh, formations, rock formations, touristy things for people to see. Uh, a couple uh, antique forts there from the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. And so it's really not that big of an area. And the police were just, they were absolutely mystified how someone could literally disappear on a quiet, sunny Sunday morning, walking along literally a, a U.S. designated highway where there are no automobiles allowed, which was Lakeshore Road. And she just disappeared. And they were, they just, they were absolutely flummoxed as to how, how this could happen uh, when, if you, if you get lost on a horse trail or a walking trail up there, you just continue to follow it and you'll eventually come to Mackinac Island, the, the village, or to another roadway. Um, it's virtually impossible for someone to get lost up there. And so that was, that was the big mystery. What happened to Francis Lacey? Right. So you, you write that one of her family members was holding out hope that she had maybe gotten amnesia, uh, perhaps just gotten lost. Others thought that she might have been depressed and committed suicide. And then, of course, the possibility, which did seem unlikely to many, that on this little virtually crime-free island, she might have been murdered. Right, right. The And it was funny because the the island residents, and, and there are about, I think, around 600 people uh, that live on the island year-round. And the general consensus among the, the residents was that she had met with foul play. The family and the searchers and the, the police, they thought she was either, uh, as you said, uh, depressed and maybe uh, had taken her own life, or that she might be injured somewhere. Because there are some rocky cliffs around the island, uh, people just didn't know. There, were, there was three or four main possibilities. And the, the post commander for the Michigan State Police, he knew the following morning uh, when the, the search really ramped up for her, that if she hadn't been found at that point, he suspected there was definitely some foul play involved. They brought in bloodhounds, right? They did, yeah. They, uh, they brought in some bloodhounds from a search and rescue organization from the west end of Michigan's Upper Peninsula over there uh, by Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota. And the, the bloodhounds actually were able to uh, follow along the uh, west end of the island at first, and then they lost the scent. And I think that happened when they got to the end of the boardwalk. And so they went around to the, the north side and they picked up her scent again out at British Landing, but she'd already been out at British Landing the previous day visiting with, with her son-in-law's family. And so that really didn't play into the search at all. And they were pretty certain that the handlers for the for the bloodhounds, they were pretty certain that she was not on the island. So what was the first clue that something sinister had happened? Well, uh, on Sunday morning, the day that she went missing, so to speak, she checked out of the Murray Hotel and she left her baggage there. And it, that's not unusual for tourists to come back and pick their baggage up later in the day when they're grabbing a ferry back over to the mainland. So she leaves her, she leaves her baggage there, and she begins to walk out to British Landing. 
literally about that same time, two people arrive on the island, and they're not supposed to be there. They're having an affair. It's a man and a woman, and they rent a bike at about 930, and they begin riding around seeing the sights. And they end up on the west side of the island, and as they're riding along Lakeshore Road at about 11 o'clock, they see a purse laying alongside the road. And so they stop and they look in it, and they see uh, some identification of a woman identified as Frances Lacey. Well, Frances Lacey hasn't been reported missing or anything. And so they said, hey, let's take this back into town with us and we'll we'll track her down at the uh, Chippewa Hotel because uh, there's a, a flyer in here for the Chippewa Hotel. So they take the purse back. And of course, the Chippewa Hotel has no idea who Francis Lacey is. Francis Lacey isn't staying there. And so they decide, well, we'll we'll just take the purse back to back to Detroit with us because this woman is from Dearborn, and we'll track her down there. And so later that day, they leave the island. Uh, Let me step back just a second. When they find the purse, they actually can hear something or someone lumbering through the brush just on the other side of a small fence, and they think it's a large animal of some type. When, in fact, police now believe that it was probably the killer having just murdered Francis Lacey. So they decide uh, to take this uh, purse that they found back to Detroit, and they'll look Francis Lacey up and give her a purse back uh, because she's from Dearborn. Four days later, on July 28th, news of Francis Lacey's disappearance has has now hit the media. And people all over the country know that there's a woman missing at this resort town in Michigan. And these people that were on the island, they see the news reports of this missing Frances Lacey, and they realize, oh my gosh, we've got her purse. So they contact the Michigan State Police. Michigan State Police find out from them about where they found it, and they head out there, and they begin to search that area. And that's when they discover Frances Lacey's body. She'd been there for four days, and she had been not only murdered, uh, she had been uh, raped and uh, strangled with her own panties. How how far away from the purse was her body? Uh, I'm going to say, I I did this on a crime scene diagram, and I don't have it in front of me right now, but... Um, it is in the book. It, I'm going to say it's no more than 50 feet away. Her her purse was found literally alongside of the road. And when, pe- when the police got there to begin to search for her body, they discovered a dental plate that she had had in her mouth uh, that was crushed on the roadway. And uh, they attributed that to probably being run over by several carriages over the previous four days. And uh, they, there was a, a two large cobblestone pillars right at that particular area with a large gate that said uh, no trespassing. And the killer had carried her body through that gate and dumped it just a, a short distance beyond the beginning of that gate. So just off the top of my head, I would say it was no less than 50 feet away. Who owned this private property. That particular gate closed off an area that was owned at that time by the Moral Rearmament Movement, the MRA. And that was a, a huge, I don't want to say cult because it wasn't a cult. It was an organization that uh, was committed to world peace and certain values um, that enhanced living in peace and things like that. And they had an area there called that they had purchased called Stonecliff, which is a very popular resort today, the Stonecliff property. But it was owned by the MRA at that point. And uh, police initially thought 
maybe there was some connection to the the moral rearmament movement, but I think there are still some people that believe that that it could have been someone from the moral rearmament movement, but I don't particularly uh, subscribe to that theory. So they find her, her body, just a horrific situation, uh, a, a tough crime scene, I'm sure, to process. Tell us about the evidence, and does any of it especially pique the interest for investigators? Oh, certainly. Um, at the crime scene, they, they, uh, they were able to locate some hair, uh, a few strands of hair, her body had started to decay uh, over the previous four days because it had been very hot and there was a stretch of some heavy rain there where they had to actually postpone the search until the rain stopped. But they did uh, retrieve some hairs and then they obviously had her panties that had been taken and used to strangle her. They were still uh, knotted around her neck. Uh, there was a small uh, stick that had been used to tighten those, almost used as, uh, I don't know, some sort of a handle to tighten the panties around her neck. Then at the autopsy, they also retrieved some hairs from her body that did not belong to her. Uh, she had black hair with some graying in it. And the, the hairs that they recovered, and I will tell you that there was only four or five, maybe six total but those were uh, light blonde to brown in color. Uh, those were analyzed at the Michigan State Police Crime Laboratory and determined that those did not belong to, to Mrs. Lacey. And so those were the main pieces of evidence that an investigator in today's world would look at thinking, wow, maybe there's a chance of some DNA analysis with those particular pieces of evidence. And so that's, that's really is the crux of this investigation. Does that evidence still exist? And if it does, is it possible to do DNA analysis on it? So it's, it's missing. Uh, what do you think the chances are of it being recovered? Well, here's the problem. I spent a, a quite a large amount of money for the police report, which was filed 63 years ago. It's about 2,000 pages long. And if, if you read through that police report, page by page by page by page by page, and you categorize it as to what are some good leads and what are some, yeah, we got this tip, but it, it went nowhere. Of particular interest in all of that to me was was the investigation that was done in 2011 when uh, police received some more information and they went to try to determine where the evidence was, whether it was located in Lansing at the uh, long-term storage with the Michigan State Police or if it was uh, located in St. Ignace at the Michigan State Police Post up there, or if it was located at the district headquarters in Marquette, Michigan, uh, which oversees several different posts in the Upper Peninsula. And the response that the investigator got was that the evidence either has been lost, misplaced, or destroyed. And so that uh, is very frustrating, not only to me, uh, I'm certain, but to the uh, to the investigators that were looking into it still in 2011, and to the family uh, that still uh, some are still alive that I'm certain would love to see uh, some sort of movement on this case. Unfortunately, right now we don't know if the evidence even still exists. Right. She was uh, 49 years old, right, when she was killed? She was, yeah. Yes. So did this couple who recovered the purse and who had probably been there while she was being murdered or very soon after, did they hear 
screams? Did anyone in the area hear hear any screams? No, uh, and and I think that the reason that is is without going into a lot of detail about Mrs. Lacey's private life, I I did find out that she had some sort of a condition where in and I'm certain that there's a uh, a technical name for it, but uh, she did not have the ability to scream. And she learned that years earlier when uh, her hair had been caught in one of those old roller washing machines, and she couldn't reach the shutoff switch to turn it off, and she lost a large portion of her hair. Um, but at that time, she couldn't scream for help. And for whatever reason, she did not have the ability to scream. And I think that's number one, could be why they didn't hear anything. Uh, the, the people that heard the lumbering through the forest uh, as they found the purse. But the other reason that they may not have heard her scream is it appears that the, the killer uh, was able to strike her in the head and maybe even knock her out even before she had a chance to realize what was happening. She did have some abrasions on her face where it appeared that she'd been struck probably from behind. Oh, goodness. So her watch was missing, right? Her watch was missing, and that, and that was never put out in the media. It was put in the police report, but it was never published in the media until around 2007, 2008. I, I'm not certain on the exact date, but uh, police kept that confidential. And that really is part of the basis for my theory into her murder, uh, is that I believe that Mrs. Lacey's killer uh, was not an island resident. I don't believe that it was an insurance hit uh, from downstate. I believe that Mrs. Lacey was killed by a very young and up-and-coming serial killer. And one of the traits of a serial killer is to take a trophy from the victim. And that way that serial killer can relive that ecstasy of that murder over and over again. He takes a little trophy. And I think that that watch could still exist out, out there somewhere. And that's why in, in the book, I published not only a, a complete description, but the serial number in the watch also. Maybe it's in somebody's jewelry box. Maybe it's in a, an antique store somewhere. You know, who knows? Who knows? But that's part of the reason that I think that, that uh, Mrs. Lacey may have been the victim of a, a young serial killer. Interesting, yeah. One of the people immediately targeted by law enforcement was a man named Paul Strantz. Why was he a suspect so early on? Well, Paul Strantz, uh, from what I gathered in the police report, was a, um, a guy who seemed to be on the streets of Mackinac Island at all times of the day and night. And he was just an odd person, according to those people who had contact with him. And so police initially interviewed him about the disappearance. And this was even before Mrs. Lacey's body was found. And he was indignant uh, that, that they would suspect him of being involved in the disappearance. And he offered to let them even search the room that he stayed in on the island. He was a transient island worker, if you will, during the summer. He would come up during the summer from Indiana and work, and then he'd go back in the fall. And so he let the police search his room. Um, they found some odd things. They found uh, some of his drawings of women. Uh, they found a newspaper article uh, crumpled up about uh, how people should, or how women should defend themselves. They found uh, what they initially thought was some blood on a shirt. It turned out to be paint. Um, they found uh, his suit that he had up there uh, was wet, and uh, 
He said that he got caught in the rain. Um, just that things weren't really adding up, but they didn't have enough to hold him. And so he was released. And once Mrs. Lacey's body was found four days later, the de- the lead detective, Anthony Sprato, uh, wanted him arrested. And so they found him coming out of one of the restaurants and they arrested him right there for the murder. And they thought, ha, ah, this will be a quick end, a quick end to this investigation. Well, they realized they didn't have any more four days later than they had initially uh, when when she disappeared. And so they had to release him. Uh, he was given a polygraph, which I believe that he passed. And then it was later, like uh, four years later, he had made the statement in a bar. Um, a couple ladies had heard him that he had uh, strangled Mrs. Lacey. And so they gave him a polygraph and his answers were so off the cuff that they couldn't, they couldn't determine one way or another whether or not he was involved. And so he was released. Uh, and he was definitely an odd, odd person. Interesting. During the autopsy, the contents of her stomach were examined, and that helped authorities learn more about her final hours, track down where she had her last meal. Right. They In, in the autopsy, they did determine that she had had a pancakes, bacon, and cantaloupe for breakfast. Uh, four days earlier. And so they began to check the hotels around the island. And one of the, one of the uh, restaurants did serve cantaloupe, but they didn't save their receipts. And uh, incidentally, the Murray Hotel where she was staying also did serve cantaloupe. And they vaguely remembered, uh, one of the waitresses vaguely remembered a woman with glasses coming in and having some pancakes, uh, cantaloupe, and bacon, and coffee for breakfast. And so they they were pretty certain that that was uh, likely Mrs. Lacey at about 9.30 uh, when she left there after eating breakfast. And so that's, that's where they started from, from the Murray Hotel. So the timing makes sense, right? She finished breakfast at about 9.30. It took her about an hour and a half to walk to where she was found. At about 11 o'clock, that's when police believed she was killed. Exactly, yeah. And, and it takes about an hour and a half for the people on the bike to work their way around the downtown area, seeing some of the sites, and to make it out to the point where she's walked to and, and has been murdered. They searched her room as well. Was anything of interest found in her room? There was. Uh, when... When she was first reported missing, the trooper uh, contacted the the Mackinac Island police, the local police, and said, hey, could you check her room? And so uh, an officer went up there, it might have even been the chief, and went up there and checked her room. And they discovered that there was a six-pack of beer under the bed, Carling Black Label Beer. Incidentally, that was mentioned only once in the police report. There was no mention that it was taken as evidence, no mention that it was fingerprinted, no mention whether or not it was uh, the bottles were open or closed. It's just like, hey, we found this this six pack of beer under the bed, and that's it. Two thousand pages later, it's never mentioned again. Should that have been uh, fingerprinted in the long run? You know, at that point, she was only missing, probably hadn't even been missing more than five or six hours at that point. Everybody thought she was probably lost. Would it have been nice to have that fingerprinted or or preserved as evidence? Absolutely. Absolutely. They did interview a couple of the the hotel maids. And honestly, after reading the police report, I think they were confused on the room. Um, They said that, that uh, her bed was unmade, and there there was some luggage in there and things like that. And so they just straightened up the bed because they thought she was still staying there. Well, we know that her her baggage was down in the in the lobby uh, after she left. 
And so I think that, that the hotel maids may have been confused on which room they were in. I'm not sure that they were ever actually in Mrs. Lacey's room. Do you think that she was followed from the restaurant or was it a chance encounter? How do you think they crossed paths? Honestly, uh, I don't think that she was followed. I think that if, if she was followed, someone would have noticed or she would have noticed and, and maybe let him pass or something. You know, Mackinac Island is virtually void of any violent crimes especially in 1960. It was unheard of. And so I think that he was likely probably, and this is just my opinion, uh, I think that he was likely coming the opposite direction. The The Michigan State Police and the FBI both offered criminal profiles of the suspect uh, much later in the 2000s. And uh, both said that she had no reason to fear him and that the assault on her was uh, what they described as a blitz style attack. And by that, I mean a very rapid, like she didn't see it coming. And so therefore, I think that that he was probably walking in the opposite direction, maybe toward town as she's walking out toward British Landing. He passes her. As soon as he passes her, he turns around, cold cocks her from behind, and then drags her off uh, up the trail through the gate and up the trail where he sexually assaults her and strangles her. That's my theory. There was another series of murders at Starved Rock State Park in the same year. Three middle-aged women were on a trip together, and they were slain. And some believe that these cases might be connected. Well, the the theory was that that they certainly could have been. Um, it was literally three months before Mrs. Lacey's murder when when the murders at Starved Rock occurred. They appeared to be at that time uh, sexually motivated. the The women were uh, without their their clothes had been um, taken off from the waist down. Um, they'd been beaten to death uh, with a club. Um, they were concealed in a cave down in Starved Rock, Illinois, at a state park. And so, you know, the, the fact that you had uh, women murdered, uh, sexually assaulted, uh, maybe sexually assaulted in a state park, certainly um, there were some similarities to the Lacey homicide. But when they finally caught the guy, uh, down there, Chester Wegger, uh, I think that's how it's pronounced. He was interviewed. Uh, he confessed to the Starved Rock murders. There was no way, uh, given the timeline, that he could have uh, possibly been involved in the Mackinac Island murders. They did some checking on on when he had gotten out of jail and when he had showed back up to work like he was supposed to, and there was just not enough time for him to travel to Mackinac Island. Uh, commit the murder and make it back to report to work on a Monday morning. And so he was discounted as a suspect. They did look at uh, a couple other serial killers from around the country, one by the name of Hugh Bayan Morris, who traveled across, traveled across the country on a murderous rape and pillage, if you will, and uh, actually admitted to having traveled through Michigan when he was interviewed about it. He said that at the time that the uh, Lacey murder occurred, he probably was in Oregon or Washington. And, and basically, that was the extent of the follow-up on Hugh and Morris. Uh, in 2012, they looked at another serial killer in the Pontiac area who had been indicted in some murders down in Ohio, too. And there really wasn't a lot of, of follow-up to that. Um, they interviewed him and basically said, well, you know, you're already in prison. You'd tell me the truth if you did another murder, right? And Oh yeah, absolutely. I would. But they also knew they didn't have any evidence at that point. The evidence couldn't be located. So they really went with his word. Uh, and one of his victims had been strangled, uh, with their own panties or pantyhose. And so that's why they looked at him for a short time. 
I did an episode on the Carol Thompson case a few years ago with William Swanson. Uh, her husband, Carol's husband, T. Eugene Thompson, went to jail for her murder. Uh, this was in St. Paul. And, and that case comes up in your book, right? How does it tie in to this one? Well, one of the, one of the suspects in a bad check complaint on Mackinac Island uh, had the same name as one of the people in the Thompson murder in Minnesota. And I think the Thompson murder occurred, in, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, but I think that occurred after the Lacey homicide. And it was, uh, Mr. Thompson had uh, hired a hitman to, to kill his wife. And one of the guys that dealt with uh, handling the money or the payoff in that was like a third, third person involved, uh, had the same name as a person uh, who had passed a bad check in 1960 on Mackinac Island. And they were never able to really say with any certainty whether or not it was the same person. As a matter of fact, one of the, the guy that actually, I think it was the guy that actually did the Thompson murder, uh, was from Michigan. He was uh, a hired hitman in the Thompson murder and was living in Lansing, Michigan at the time and was from, I think it was Alden, Michigan, which is like 90 miles from Mackinac. So there was a lot of little things that really, when you look back in hindsight, you go, wow, why didn't they look at this guy? But when you look at the police reports, they mention it briefly, and that's it. Uh, th there's no police reports indicating any follow-up on, on that at all. And uh, I think that, that they should have looked a little harder at, at not only the guy that passed the bad check, Shelley, on Mackinac Island, but at the guy that was the, the trigger man in the Thompson murder. Right, right. Uh, th there were other men on the island, uh, suspects, as you've already talked a bit about. A guy named Bill Rankin, who left his job as a dishwasher at a restaurant the morning she disappeared, left the island. And another guy, there was another guy named Philip Gothel. And there were others. There were. And, and several of those guys were cleared through, um, through the hair analysis. I had some of the lab reports in the uh, in the police report that I got that said, "Oh, no, this guy is not. His hair doesn't match the hairs that were taken off the victim." There was one guy that they looked at very strongly, a guy by the name of Harold Asp. Uh, he was a bartender at the at the uh, Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, and uh, there, Harold came up sort of missing. He quit his job and. And they found his luggage on the uh, at the ferry dock, but yet he was gone. And he ended up showing up down in Detroit at a hotel down there. And they found uh, the the reason that they looked at him as a suspect, not only because he abruptly left the island, but uh, when they found his suit coat in the abandoned hotel room that he had rented, uh, it had a Mackinac Island baggage claim. Uh, which matched the the baggage that was found on the uh, on the ferry dock on the island, and so they eventually found him. Uh, he basically turned himself into the Indiana State Police uh, down in Indianapolis, and so the Michigan State Police sent some detectives down there to interview him, and he was he was adamant. Hey, you know, uh, I left, but it wasn't me, and they were able to verify his story. And he said, I'll do you one better. He said, I'll fly back to Mackinac Island with you and clear my name. And so he did. And he took a lie detector test. But the interesting thing is that uh, the lab technician, the scientist that did the uh, hair analysis, said that uh, hairs taken off the coat that was recovered from the hotel room that was abandoned in Detroit could not be excluded 
from the suspect. But it turns out that wasn't Harold Asp's coat. It was a coat that he'd found in the hotel room that he was staying at at the Grand Hotel, and nobody claimed it, so he took it with him. So there was a bunch of twists and turns with Harold Asp, but they were certain in the end that, uh, absolutely certain that he was not involved in that. A few weeks after Mrs. Lacey's murder, there was another brutal killing of an older woman who had connections to the island. Bertha de Corval had met with a horrific end not long after she had returned home. She did. Uh, Mrs. de Corval, uh, the reason that Mrs. de Corval's homicide was of interest in the Lacey homicide is because Mrs. de Corville had traveled with her granddaughter to uh, Mackinac Island just a month or a couple weeks after the murder. And uh, she'd heard about the murder. And according to her granddaughter, uh, she said, I'm not going to be the victim of a murder. Uh, I'm not leaving the Grand Hotel. So she stayed on the porch at the Grand Hotel the whole time, um, didn't travel around. And she was only there four or five days, and and they traveled by bus back to uh, Flint. And they were picked up uh, at the bus station by her son and his wife, and they dropped Mrs. DeCorville off at her house. And they took their their granddaughter or their daughter, uh, Mrs. De Corville's granddaughter. They took their daughter back to their home, and their daughter realized, "Oh gosh, I forgot the key to my luggage." Um, well, it was ten o'clock at night, so she said, "I'll just go over to Grandma's in the morning and get it." When when she did the next morning, uh, she found her grandmother had been murdered. She found her just inside the front door, um, and she'd been beaten to death. And because she had just literally that previous day, returned from Mackinac Island. They wondered if the killer, Mrs. Lacey's killer, didn't follow her down on the bus and kill her trying to rob her. Um, But they were, in the end, they were certain uh, because the the method of operation was completely different. Uh, Mrs. DeCorville was not sexually assaulted. Um, She wasn't strangled. She'd been beaten to death. And so they were pretty confident that Mrs. DeCorville's homicide was not related to Mrs. Lacey's. Some believed that Mrs. Lacey's son-in-law, Wesley Sutter, might have had some financial motivation to do his mother-in-law in. There was spec. Well, I would say there still is speculation about that. And I don't go into a lot of detail about why that is. Uh, well, I do... Uh, go into uh, quite a bit of detail about her financial records. But as far as her son-in-law, who's now deceased, uh, playing a part in her murder, it was simply uh, some opinions that I gathered from some of the people that I talked to on the island. Uh, Some of them said, I think it was an insurance job. I think that, that somebody benefited from her life insurance. And there were, there were other, uh, like a former city official that I interviewed who said uh, he thought it was uh, an island resident that might have done it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of speculation. And, and I'll be honest with you, you know, uh, my, my theory is also speculation. But I think my theory has a lot more weight than the other two. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of, of that... You have a suspect, a new suspect that you think might have some validity. And I know you're keeping his identity close to your vest as you speak about this case in various media outlets. But without naming names, can you tell us about him? Why you think he might be someone that deserves a stronger look? Well, without going into how I came across his name, I will tell you that his first arrest was in 1961 in Ann Arbor. He raped a blind woman uh, and then threw her out of a moving car, probably hoping that that she wouldn't survive, but she did. And uh, he was arrested for that, and he was sentenced to prison. 
He got out of prison in 1969. And in 1973, there was a woman who was kidnapped, raped, and murdered in uh, Owasso, Michigan. And then in 1982, there was a 16-year-old girl who was kidnapped and murdered in Carson City, Michigan. And her body was found two weeks later. Uh, the same M.O. as uh, the Lacey homicide. Uh, and police made an arrest in that case two years later, and it was this particular person. And the search warrant in that case ended up being thrown out, and so they lost all the evidence, and the case was dismissed. So that case, well, we're certain he's responsible for the murder of that 16-year-old, that case remains unsolved. In 1998, he was arrested for the 1973 murder of the woman from Owasso. And that case, uh, which had gone cold for 28 years, uh, was finally put to rest after his arrest and conviction for that. Um, what makes him stand out as a suspect in this case is uh, his first arrest in 1961. He was interviewed in 1959, a year before the Lacey homicide, in a, a wedding announcement in a local paper in southern Michigan, where he said that he intended to go to college at the Michigan Institute of Mining and Technology, which now is Michigan Tech up in Houghton Hancock, Michigan, in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. So he obviously had some knowledge and some connection to Upper Michigan. Uh, he had light brown to blonde hair. He was 18 to 19 years old. And incidentally, uh, one of the witnesses that was interviewed in the Lacey homicide uh, described seeing three people on the morning of the Lacey homicide along Lakeshore Road. One of those was two people on a tandem bike, which ended up being the people that found the wallet. And the other person they saw was an 18 to 19 year old male walking along Lakeshore Road with his shirt undone. And of course, that was probably the killer uh, and they didn't even realize it. So you have someone who's 18 to 19, this particular person uh, that I'm describing has light brown to blonde hair. He's got connections to northern Michigan. And uh, at the time that he was arrested for the uh, rape of the blind woman in 1961, he was attending the University of Michigan. Well, University of Michigan had, the, the island was crawling with University of Michigan students working there during the summer. And several of them were interviewed. Several of them weren't interviewed. And so there's just too many connections there to say that he shouldn't at least be looked at as a person of interest. Yeah, interesting. Wow. It must have been frightening for the permanent residents of the island once that summer of 1960 had passed and they were all alone, wondering if the killer was one of their own. It, it, it. I'm certain that it was. Um, the, the newspaper articles that I researched for this uh, said that the island residents were quite weary. Uh, they had no idea, you know, is it one of us? You know, is it one of our own here on the island that murdered this, this tourist from Dearborn? I talked to uh, an island resident. She was quite elderly. Uh, she did not want her name listed in the book, and so I didn't. But she said, yeah, the, the feeling on the island was everybody was scared that lived on the island because nobody knew. And as a matter of fact, her mother, she said she was just a young girl at the time, but her mother freaked out because Paul Strantz had been in their house washing windows the week before um, because he was a ha local handyman. He did odd jobs around town. And several people felt that way about Paul Strantz after, after he was listed as a suspect in this. 
So yeah, the the island was on edge. Uh, all the local residents were on edge. Uh, I know your your book hasn't been out long, but have you gotten any feedback about it yet from Mackinac Island residents? Is it available to purchase there? Well, that's a that's a great question. Um, I I have not gotten any feedback from anyone on the island. I've gotten a lot of a lot of feedback from from my followers on my social media pages, uh, very supportive. It's uh, four and a half stars on Amazon. Uh, I just, it's funny you should mention that because I just got a, uh, a little post on Facebook uh, from someone that said, Hey, what do you do when you're on Mackinac Island? You read a good book and he's holding up uh, a picture of, uh, or he's holding up a copy of Grim Paradise, my book. And so I texted him or sent him back a message and I said, hey, I've been waiting for it to hit the island. Uh, Thanks. And he said, I picked it up at the island bookstore right on the island. So I know it made it up there. Um, I know that they do carry it. And I look forward to to hearing from anybody uh, that reads it and enjoys it and indicates where they're picking it up at. That's great. Uh, Well, yes. Speaking of picking up your book. Where is a good place to get it, and how can listeners communicate with you? I know you mentioned already you have a Facebook page. I do. Uh, I have a Facebook page. It's Rod Sadler Author, and uh, I have an uh, Instagram page. I have a Twitter, I'm sorry, an X page, and I also have a LinkedIn page, and I also have a website, rodsadler.com. It's very simple. R O D S A D L E R dot com. And uh, it's available uh, literally through Amazon, uh, Schuler Books, Barnes and Noble, but you can literally get it anywhere that you can purchase books. Uh, any bookstore can order it. It's available at some local bookstores here in the Lansing, Michigan area. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's available at uh, a place called Cops and Donuts. It's uh, uh, the Clare City Bakery in Clare, Michigan. It's owned by a bunch of uh, former police officers, and uh, they carry books written by by Michigan authors, uh, including some of my true crime. And so it's available anywhere, and you can actually go, if you're looking for a signed copy, you can go directly to my website and look for the signed copy button. Uh, click that. It'll walk you through um, how to make payment, and I will get the order. I'll sign the book. I'll personalize it however you want and ship it right to you. So several different options out there. Excellent. Yeah. All great options. Well, well, thank you again for joining me and sharing the story with us. Well, it's a it's a very in-depth case, and it's very hard to I think it's very hard to explain it. I think it's easier to read the book and 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 figure it out. But uh, you did a great job, and and I I thank you for having me as a guest on your podcast, Eric. It was a, a sincere pleasure. Again, I have been speaking to Rod Sadler. His book is called Grim Paradise: The Cold Case Search for the Mackinac Island Killer. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.